Aren't you glad he saves today? 441 in your hymnal, 441. I wandered in the shades of night till Jesus came to me. Sunlight, sunlight in my soul today. Let's all stand together as we sing 441 together. I wandered in the shades of night till Jesus came to me. And with the sunlight of his love it all my darkness flee. Sunlight, sunlight in my soul today. Sunlight, sunlight all along the way. Since the Savior found me, took away my sin. I have had the sunlight of his love within. The clouds may gather. singing this morning. Great to have you all out this morning on this beautiful Sunday morning. Let's open in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for giving us this uh, wonderful day that we can sing praises to you, we can learn from your word, we can give to you. Lord, we can just worship you all day long. And we're just so grateful for that, that we can show your worth because you are so worthy. Lord, I pray that as uh, we uh, continue on this service, that you would be blessed. I pray that uh, you would give us exactly what we need as a message is brought forth. Thank you so much for all you're doing in this place. In Jesus' precious name, amen. You may be seated.
good singing this morning. It is truly joy unspeakable and full of glory. If you have a uh, bulletin, if you'll uh, pull that out, if you would. We have some announcements to mention this morning. This uh, coming Wednesday, I believe, July 30th, the teens are going to be going to the uh, Great Lakes Youth Conference there in Cleveland, Ohio. They went last year, had just an amazing time. Uh, it really is a, a life-changing trip for them. Uh, we have a couple of uh, new teens in our youth department that uh, would love to be able to go. Um, and uh, so we're going to uh, look to see from our congregation if we can uh, get a little bit of scholarships for them. Um, Jose and Hunter, both, uh, they've been uh, coming the last uh, several weeks and um, they're saved, got baptized, and they're just looking forward to that. And uh, so we're, we're hoping to be able to uh, have them go also. That's $100 a person, so we'll need $200. And if that's something the Lord would uh, burden your heart for, to uh, let these uh, two young men go to the youth conference. Uh, if you just uh, notate that on uh, your on offering envelope or uh, in some way, or give it to Brother Andy, that's fine as well. But uh, it's $100 a piece for these two young men. Uh, so if you'd uh, really be uh, uh, prayerfully considering that, uh, we would uh, need to be able to have that today uh, for them to be able to leave on Wednesday, all right? Uh, so that'll be just a great, uh, great time. Um, and then uh, be also prayerfully considering uh, next Sunday is our uh, Give God Glory offering, uh, the renovation offering. Um, if you've not noticed yet, the ladies' restroom is closed for renovation. We have uh, begun um, tearing that out and hopefully in very short uh, work be able to put it back together. We have begun in faith. Uh, remodeling that and tearing it out, knowing that uh, God's people will uh, uh, be able to uh, provide uh, for the funds to take care of that. Uh, the goal is to have it uh, completely finished uh, for our um, uh, anniversary Sunday coming up. Uh, that'll be August 15th and 16th is uh, that homecoming weekend. Uh, plan on being here. It's going to be a great time. Uh, beginning at 4 o'clock, we'll have a, uh, a barbecue uh, dinner. And uh, we, we'll just have some uh, a bunch of fun games. I believe we'll have the bounce house up and uh, volleyball and sack races and <coughs> all kinds of fun stuff. And then at 6 o'clock, we'll come back in here, and um, we're going to have a, an old-fashioned old gospel sing and a uh, concert with the Hambies and the Richardsons, and it'll just be a great, great time. So uh, make sure and plan on being here on the 15th. That's Saturday, uh, 4 o'clock, and then also um, back in here on uh Sunday as well. Uh, that would be fantastic. There will not be a Christian growth class tonight. We will begin that again next week. Um, let's uh, welcome any visitors we might have. If you haven't, uh, if this is the first time you've been here, or maybe the first time in a long time, would you uh, indicate that by just raising your hand for us so we can meet you? Yes, sir. Okay. Fantastic. Good to have you, Bruce. Thanks so much. Great. All right. Anybody else? First time? Justin, you're going to admit that this is the first time here? No, you're not going to admit that. Third row from the back, young man. Uh, uh, Justin McKeon uh, is up from Florida. Great to have. Good, good to have you, Justin. Anybody else? This is your first time here? No. All right, if you'll take the uh, visitor card there and uh, fill it out, keep the pen as our gift to you for coming, and the card, if you'll put it in the offering when it uh, goes by here in a little bit, we'd sure appreciate that. Let's uh, give these two guys a warm welcome. Bye. 
246, 246, if you would. I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day. Higher ground, 246. On that first together, I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day. this last stanza let's let the children go out to children's church we're going to sing i want to scale the utmost height and catch a gleam of glory bright on that last together i want to scale the utmost height and catch a gleam singing this morning 241 just back a few pages marvelous grace of our loving lord grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt let's all stand together one more time if you would let's sing that first all together marvelous grace of another make somebody feel welcome especially our guests we'll come back and sing that last stanza together
is a stain that we cannot hide. What can avail to wash it away? Look, there is flowing a crimson tide, whiter than snow you may be today. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will infinite massless grace let's sing that all together when we get to the chorus we'll have the instruments drop out on that last marvelous infinite Yesters come to take up the morning offering. Probably should have mentioned it earlier, earlier, but if you haven't been able to tell yet, Pastor is not here. He's on a well-deserved vacation. He will be back next Sunday, refreshed and raring to go. But uh, he did uh, send a message this morning saying that he is uh, uh, missing everybody and wishes he could be here. But uh, thinking of us and praying for us this morning as we... Uh, Go on with the morning service, all right? So um, appreciate uh, everybody being here. Great, uh, great uh, crowd this morning. Brother Bob Wallace, would you ask the Lord to bless the offering, please? Let us pray. Father, you're such a great God. Yes, Lord. Lord, we're here to listen from you. Lord, help us to take this time serious. Help us not to take it lightly. Lord, because we know that you do want to have a time with us that you speak through your word to us. And Father, we all need to hear. So Lord, we'd ask that you help us to submit to your will, to listen, with hearing ears. And Lord, may we obey what we are taught. Lord, thank you for this time, this privilege that we have to come and worship you. Lord, we ask now that you bless this offering as only you can. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
Thank you, Lisa. That's one of those hymns that we sing a lot. We say the words a lot, but I'm not sure we really uh, think about what it's saying. I am resolved no longer to linger. Around the first part of January, we always like to do these resolutions. We say, I am resolved. I am not going to whatever, or I am going to whatever, but I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delight. Things that are higher, things that are nobler, these have allured my sight in the past. I am resolved to go to the Savior, leaving my sin and strife. He is the true one. He is the just one. He hath the words of life. I am resolved to follow the Savior, faithful and true each day. Heed what he saith, do what he willeth. He is the living way. That's a great, great hymn. I, I hope when we're, the offering, offertory is being uh, played and we're uh, singing these songs, think about those words. They're just powerful. Some incredible doctrine in these uh, great hymns. We have a tremendous opportunity to have our dear friend and brother uh, Ron Moreland uh, preach uh, for us this morning and uh, this evening as well. And uh, just uh, looking forward to uh, hearing what God has uh, for us uh, from him. Uh, before he comes, Nikki, you have a, a special for us, please. turn into your Bibles into 2 Kings, 2 Kings chapter 6, 2 Kings chapter 6. Does anybody here not have a Bible? Anybody not have a Bible? All right. okay. Aaron, if you don't mind helping him a little bit and find where 2 Kings is. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. And notice there, it's just not by hearing, but you have to have the Word of God. And I want to make sure that everybody can 
not just hear it, but they're seeing what they're hearing. Amen? I believe that's how God works. God is so good. I've really enjoyed the music this morning. Get your hearts set to hear the Word of God. Please come back tonight as I'll be sharing um, this last trip in Armenia and our ministry and what the Lord is doing in Central Asia and actually in the Middle East also. And the Lord is doing so much work that we do not realize. And uh, we've had even uh, some more doors open this last week for us. And I'm very excited to, to share that work with you and, uh, because it's, it, it's not just myself and my family going, it's all of us. It's, all, it's the church, and it's the job of the church to do the work that we're doing. And, and I just appreciate you guys being willing to send us out. And Sometimes I, I think some of you guys can't wait to kick us out, you know, get us over there. That's good. Second Kings chapter 6, if you all stand for the reading of God's word. We'll start in verse 24. And it came to pass after this that Benahad, Hadad, king of Syria, gathered all his hosts and went up and besieged Samaria. And there was a great famine in Samaria, and behold, they besieged it until an ass's head was sold for fourscore pieces of silver, and a fourth part of the cab of dove's dung for five pieces of silver. And as the king of Israel was passing by upon the wall, there cried a woman unto him, saying, Help, my lord, O king. And he said, If the Lord do not help thee, when shall I help thee? Out of the barn floor, or out of the wine press? And the king said unto her, What aileth thee? And she answered, said, This woman said unto me, Give thy son, that we may eat him today, and we will eat my son tomorrow. So we boiled my son, and did eat him. And I said unto her, on the, on the next day, give thy son that we may eat him, and she hath hid her son. And it came to pass, when the king heard the words of the woman, that he rent his clothes, and he passed by upon the wall, and the people looked, and behold, he had sackcloth within upon his flesh. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, once again we come before your throne, and we thank you, Lord, for... Um, for being able to be in a country that's still free, that we can still come into your house and worship you. Lord, please uh, help us see that it's all about you and it's not about us. Lord, use me as a tool today. Open up the hearts, the minds, the eyes and ears of those so we can see who you are today, that you'll get all the glory and your name will be magnified. And Lord, we do look forward to your coming. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. amen. Wouldn't that be great today that as we're sitting here and here in church, that the Lord would come. Wouldn't that be great? And all of a sudden, we're face to face with Him. <clears throat> First of all, I want to say that God can use anyone at any time. No matter who you are, God can use you and can use certain circumstances around about you. And it's not with what we think we see. You know, you're, you've always heard the, the, the saying, uh, don't judge a book by its cover. Today, that's what we're going to kind of talk about. We're going to talk about four unlikely heroes in chapter 7 here in a minute. But first of all, I want us to look at the condition of this people we're talking about today here in, in chapter 6. The condition of the people. First of all, we see that there is a great famine. In verse 25, it said, There is a great famine in Syria. And Behold, they besieged it until an ass's head was sold for four score pieces of silver and a fourth part of the cab of dove's dung for five pieces of silver. Notice the desperateness that they had. I think that's a word I just made up, desperateness. That they, just, that they had for money and also for food to live on. They were selling uh, a, the head of an ass. You know, It doesn't have a whole lot of meat on it. You know, does have some. But then notice that they're also selling doves done. Are they selling it for food? Are they selling it for fire? They're, they're, they're money. They're, they're trying to sell something they have or something that's around them for money. That's how desperate these people are. That they're willing to buy doves done. I tell you what, we are living in a world today that there are people all over the world 
that are doing the same thing? We don't realize that we are so blessed to live in the country we are. And we take God's word and we just throw it out the window. We take uh, everything that we know, our morals and everything, throw it out the window. And we see where the world is going today. Now we have men you know, shooting into recruitment centers. Our soldiers aren't allowed to have rifles. You know, walking into a theater, you can't even go into a theater without worrying about being shot. You know what? I don't worry about it. Because we're going to see here that God is in control. It doesn't matter how bad the world gets and what we think is going on, there's only one person in control, and that's God. You know, the world would like to say that, God, why do you do this? Why are people dying? Why are people starving to death? Why don't you do something? And God looks at us and he goes, why do you think I created you? He's given us a purpose. And we're going to see that here very shortly. They were even so desperate, the condition of the people was so desperate, they were even eating their children. They were even eating their children. When the enemy surrounds you, great tribulation happens. You can't move. You can't live. The enemy has stopped everything that you know so they can have full control of you. And so what happens when Satan and the world surrounds you? No hope. No freedom. Death is at the door. And we see this in certain countries. I've been in, in certain countries where, man, you just think death is right at the door. Hey, you can feel the presence, the evilness. And it's unbelievable. But note, a famine of the word of God can cause great and unthinkable sin. Let me say that again. A famine of the word of God can cause great and unthinkable sin. When you start throwing the Bible out, it causes great sin. When you throw God out of your country, it causes great sin. There's still over 4,000 languages that still do not have a Bible. I said it once and I'll say it again. How did Christ fight Satan in the wilderness? The Word. He said, as it is written. It was the written Word. I've had preachers even come up to me and says, well, it says, faith comes by hearing. And I said, I know you're saying the verse, but you're not hearing it. Faith comes by hearing, but hearing by the Word of God. We, they have to have the Bible. They have to have the Word of God. And we see here, here we have that where, where an enemy has surrounded an area and great and unthinkable sin is happening. Now I want us to go down in, to chapter 7. And we're going to talk about four unlikely heroes. God can use anybody he wants. That's, what's it, that, that's one of the exciting parts of, of, of you know, being in missions, I would say. Even just being a Christian, God can use you and use even your enemies to do his work. He doesn't really need me. He might need me to carry something over here. But here in a little bit, I'm going to share a couple stories that I've, that I've seen overseas. And I get a crack up out of it every time I hear it because God is in control. Chapter 7, verse 1, it says, Then Elisha said, Hear ye the word of the Lord. That saith the Lord, Tomorrow about this time shall a measure of fine flour be sold for a shekel, and two measures of barley for a shekel in the gate of Samaria. Now we go back, it's the messenger from the king coming up in uh, verse 32 and verse 33 of chapter 6. The, there's a messenger coming and he's asking, What else? What else is going to go on? Elisha's saying, Just wait. And you'll see. Verse 2 of chapter 7. Then the Lord on whose hand the king lead answered in the man of God and said, Behold, if the Lord would make widows in heaven, might this thing be? And he said, Behold, thou shalt see it with thine eyes, be, but shalt not eat thereof. There, there's always a doubter. There's always a doubter in the crown. And anytime you're saying, man, you just wait. The Lord's going to do this. What? You think the Lord of heaven who makes widows is going to go ahead and go do this? Really? People are dying. 
And God, you think this is going to happen? There's always doubters out there. We just have to be able to stand up and say, yeah, I believe. My God is alive, he is real, and I'm going to show you. Verse 3, And there were four leprous men at the entering of the gate. And they said one to another, Why sit we here until we die? If we say we will enter into the city, then the famine is in the city, and we shall die there. And if we sit still here, we die also. Now therefore come, and let us fall unto the host of the Syrians. They're wanting to go to the enemy. If they, shall, if they save us alive, we shall live. If they kill us, we shall but, but die. They're saying, you know, hey, we're going to live or die here. We're going to die anyway. We might as well go over there and just get it done with. Verse 5, And they rose up in the twilight to go into the camp of the Syrians. And when they were come to the uttermost part of the camp of Syria, behold, there was no man there. For the Lord had made the host of the Syrians to hear a noise of chariots and a noise of horses. Now, who made this noise? God did, God did the Lord. Right. And even the noise of great hosts. And they said one to another, Lo, the king of Israel hath hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to come upon us. Wherefore they arose and fled in the twilight and left their tents and their horses and their asses, even, at the, even the camp as it was, and fled for their life. And when these lepers came to the uttermost part of the camp, they went into one of the tents and did eat and drink and carried thence silver and gold and raiment and went and hid it and came again and entered into another tent and carried thence also and went and hid it. Man, these leprous men. Here's men that were dying. They had to sit with outside of the city. They were looked down upon. They were looked as unclean. If they went anywhere, they had to yell, unclean, unclean. What an embarrassment for these people. They were in pain. They had a disease. They were, even some of them lose body parts and limbs to this disease. Because the muscle, the tissue, everything starts dying. But they're still, or they still have a soul. But they were hungry, they were tired, and had enough. I've heard that heroes are usually the ones that are tired and hungry, and they've had enough. You know what? If we're going to do it, let's do it. I'm tired, I'm hungry, and I've had enough. Let's go fight. And I love the saying, why sit here until we die? They're saying there, why are we sitting here until we die? There's so much more we could possibly do. If we go in there, we're going to probably die. If we go to the enemies, there's a chance we might live. Maybe they'll throw us a, a chicken bone. Maybe they'll give us something. But if not, we're going to die anyway. But God has a purpose for these four men. God put it, I believe God put it within their hearts. Let's move, let's go do something. So they had to decide not to stay. They had to move. They had to move. And notice here that they had the intervention of God. In verse 6 it says, For the Lord had made, made the host of the Syrians to hear a noise of chariots. The Lord made the Syrians, the enemy, hear a great noise. So they had to move so he could have these four unlikely heroes come in. Do you know if God calls you to a certain ministry or a certain job or anything in your life, if God calls you to it, he will make a path for you? We don't have to make the path for ourselves. My goodness. Have you ever seen a path that I made? I can't find it when I turn around. I mess it up. God will make that path for us, that we can see it and we can go through it. We say, well, I'm waiting on God to open the door. There's a lot of us that God has opened the door a long time ago. We just decided to stay in the other room. But why are we going to sit here until we die? God made a path. I remember hearing a soldier just not too long ago um, 
that was in this, um, where Israel and Lebanon, several years ago, what was that, about 10, 12, 15 years ago? They had the war. Everybody's looking for Armageddon to start right then. We were waiting and praying. We were all out there doing our rapture practicing off our porch. And, and the, the Lebanese, there is one tank there in Israel sitting there guarding this road. And they could see the other tanks and the people, the enemy, coming across. But the enemy stopped, and they surrendered. And the one that the Israeli tank driver looked at the other one and goes, what do we do? He's like, I don't know what we do. He goes, grab your gun, because they're surrendering. All right. So they went, and the other army was surrendering. And as they got them in, and was interrogating, they said, why did you surrender? And they said, because we saw the whole army of Israel with you all. God opened the enemy's eyes to see that. A lot of us would say, no, that's not how it works. Yes, that's how it works. That's how it works. God has opened our eyes to see certain things at certain times, and even our enemy at certain times. Sometimes God has given us blessings, and we don't see it. You know why? Because we're blind to ourselves. We're so infatuated with ourselves, we can't see what God does. But there is a great intervention that God had made for these guys. So they decided not to stay. They had to go. Now let's read down here. We'll start down here in verse 9 where we stop <coughs> and go a little bit farther. So we're talking about this leprous men. They're within a camp. They got all this stuff. They're hiding it. And then they said one to another, we do not well. This is not good. This day is a day of good tidings, and we hold our peace. If we tarry till morning, until morning light, so mischief, mischief will come upon us. Now therefore come that we may go and tell the king's household. So they came and called unto the porter of the city, and they told them, saying, We came to the camp of the Syrian, and behold, there was no man there, neither voice of man, but horses tied, and asses tied in the tents as they were. And he called the porters, and they told it to the king's house within. Notice here he says, man, there's nobody there. But now we got horses, we got asses, we got the tents, we got everything. It's all there. But notice they had to, they had to go to get that. They had to leave to where they were to go get that blessing. But they decided not to keep what they had. They decided not to stay, and then they decided not to keep what they had. They knew that their people back here in the city were dying. They knew of the sin that was going on. They were hungry. They were tired. They were giving up. So these men decided not to, not to keep what they had, but to go tell the porter, to go tell the king's house, hey, this is what we found. Get everybody out here. Get everybody out here. So now they can have some of the blessing also. Let's go a little bit farther. Verse 12, And the king arose in the night and said unto his servants, I will now show you what the Syrians have done to us. They know that we be hungry, therefore are they gone out of the camp to hide themselves in the field, saying, When they come out of the city, we shall catch them alive and get into the city. The king's like, hey man, this is just a big joke. It's like a flank. You know, they're hiding over there in the, in the woods, and once we get there, they're going to come in and kill everybody so we can get into, so they can take over our city. But that's not how God worked it out. Verse 13, And one of the servants answered and said, Let some take, I pray thee, five of the horses that remain which are left in the city. Behold, they are as all the multitude of Israel and are left in it. Behold, I say, they are even as all the multitude of the Israelites that are consumed. And let us send and see. So they took their, therefore two chariot horses, and the king sent after the host of Syrian, saying, Go and see. And they went after them unto Jordan, and lo, all the way was full of garments and vessels, which the Syrians had cast away in their haste. And the messengers returned and told the king, and the people went out and spoiled the tents of the Syrians. So a measure of fine flour 
was sold for a shekel and two measures of barley for a shekel according to the word of God. So they decided not to keep what they had. They knew what the city and the kinsmen needed and they decided not to keep it but to go tell them so they can come get, get it also. The number three, they decided not to withhold what they knew. They decided not to withhold what they knew. They knew if they kept everything, they could have they lived it up. They could have lived and stayed quiet the whole time and lived a life of a lot of value that leprous people live. They still were lepers. But they could have ate. They could have been rich and lived it up. And they knew where they were hiding things but they decided not to keep what they knew. They decided not to stay. They decided not to keep it, and they decided not to keep what they know. Let me ask you this. What do you have that the rest of the world needs? We say it, but do we actually go tell them? Some of us do. Some of us just stay silent. Well, they're friends, and I don't want to fight with them or their family and their blood and I don't want to cause anything and I love them. Well, you're loving them straight to the pits of hell, folks. In all due respect, at least give it a try. And don't just talk to them about it. Let them read it. Let them read the Bible. If they don't have a Bible, give it to them. Brother Jarvis, next time you're down in Milford, I want us to grab both you and me when I'm next down there. Let's grab a box of Bibles and bring them up here. We got too many people in this area that do not have a Bible of their own. They can go get it anywhere, but they don't want to. I think, number one, they don't know that they need it. So let's give it to them as a gift. Maybe we can help some people. <laughs> and then have you been sharing what you know? Have you been sharing what you know? You ever go in a place and they're like, hey, hey, Ralph, what do you know? Nothing. I know I hate my job. I know this is the lousiest food I've eaten in a while. But we don't... I know, guys, I, I know we preach it. I know we talk about it, but do we actually do it? When I was in Armenia, we handed out over 10,000 whole Armenian Bibles. They cried over it. They were so excited that they would kiss their Bible and then they kissed our hands and kissed our cheeks. They were so excited to have a Bible of their own. They said, you know, do you realize how long we've been waiting for this? I said, well, the person who translated it lives just on the north side of the city. I got to meet the translator. I knew the publishing company who did it. And I got to meet the printers right here out in Milford. And I got to hand them out. I handed out over 200 Bibles within five minutes. Five to ten minutes, just bam, bam. It's like I was handing out hundred dollar bills. They were so hungry for it. And then we have a world that we live in here in the state saying, You don't need that. That was written by men. Really? How do you know that was written by men? Well, I know what the Bible says. No, you don't. Because most of the Christians I, I that I know don't even know what the Bible says. We have the precious word of God. The problem is, is that we need to be able to be able to stand up and move. We don't need to be staying where we are in our little comfortable zone. I'm sure those lepers were pretty comfortable just getting a little bit of money they could, getting this and that, but it got pretty desperate because there was no money. If you're selling bird dung, I'm pretty sure you don't have a whole lot of money. I can sit here and put that book right there. That is a worthless book. It's worthless. It's closed. It's sitting there. If I come in next Sunday, I guarantee it will probably be right there. But if I go over and I take it, now it has feet. 
Now it has hands. I can open it. It has eyes. I can read it. It has a voice. I can speak it. But if I just let it lay there, it's worthless. What are you guys doing? What are we doing as Christians? Half the world, more than half the world's population does not know who Jesus Christ is. You know what the problem is with the Muslims? They have a big problem. You know what it is? They're sinners. They're lost. Just like a lot of us sitting here today. They're really no different than a lot of us. They have a religion. They think they know what's right. They got their own Bible. But they don't have the Word of God. And half of the, more than half the Muslim population does not even have a word of God in their own language that they could read and understand. How are they ever supposed to come to the saving knowledge of God if they can't even have a Bible? What's the best way to make an enemy a friend? Get them saved. Show them who Christ is. Man, wouldn't that be great if we saw all of Central Asia and the Middle East, everybody who we thought were our enemies, become to God, come to God and they become saved? Well, I hate them because they're shooting everybody. Well, then you got some problems. I understand it. I mean, I don't hate them. But if you look at it through God's eyes, they're lost. They're sinners. Number one, you don't go around and kill soldiers I will back up our soldiers in a heartbeat if I have to go to war I will go to war with any of our soldiers in a heartbeat I'm a patriot I love America I believe God still has his hand on America but he wants to see us come together a lot of us are waiting on a great revival to happen the problem is a great revival is happening over there on the other side of the ocean right now Man, there's people in Iran, churches, house churches going on like crazy right now. That we can get into and we can help those national pastors, encourage them and help train them. Pakistan, Afghanistan, Turkmenistan, Tajikistan, Stan Slayable, anything, we can just use a stand. <laughs> I said, what a perfect name for a pastor when you're working in all the stands. They had a job to do. They had to go. They had to overcome adversity. That can't be reversed. Notice once they left, they left. And they were going. They couldn't reverse it. They had a deep satisfaction that they can deliver. They knew. They said, man, this is wrong. But we need to go back. Don't you think they felt good when the people of their city came in and got all that and was able to be fed? and they had money again, and they had riches again, they was able to... Man, you're talking about a revival right there. I could see that happening. Yeah. When you share the Word of God with somebody, and you see the light come on, and you see the tears start running, man, there's nothing like it in the world. And I'm like, thank you, God. I've never once got anybody saved. But I've been able to show them to salvation and God saved them, not me. Have you got anybody saved today? Nope. I'm, don't ask me to do that because I, I don't think my blood's clean enough. My blood would just stain it. His washed it white as snow. And they had to recommend an unlikely place. Of all the places to go to get fed, and to get rejuvenated, get revived, they had to go into enemy territory. They were spies. It was all James Bond in the desert. They had to go. Some of the greatest blessings that we will ever get will be in unlikely places. The world keeps on looking in the unlikely places that they think they're going to get a blessing. And they say, well, the church is the unlikely place. Well, come on in. I'll show you a blessing. It's exciting to be able to, to be uh, in God's family. 
It's exciting to be in the ministry. I never ever dreamed I'd get to do what I'm getting ready, what we're doing. The Lord has me going into some of the most dangerous areas in the world. Armenia was per I felt perfectly safe there. It's still not the greatest place because you're surrounded by Muslim countries. But Kyrgyzstan, they eat horse. They eat dog. They eat anything they can find. They're so poor. And I love it. I'm a nut. They don't even have McDonald's. <laughs> Amen. Yeah, thanks, Bob. That's why I bond to a friend. <laughs> but we have to be able to be willing to get up and move. Do not, don't ever be worried about what God's going to do. If he's called you, then you go. God will take care of the finances. God will find a way to pay off all your bills. He'll pay off your house, your car, even if you have to get rid of them and get something else. So be it. You still got a roof over your head. Well, I got to leave family. I left family. I found out I had a bigger family. I met, I'll tell you more about tonight, but I went, met one of the nicest Armenian men ever. We went up to him, and we had this big church service, and a couple other missionaries uh, or from the Southern Baptist Church introduced me to him. And I won't give his name, but he said, he said, this is so-and-so, and, -so and He's working back and forth and goes down to Tehran, Iran. Has some house churches down there. I said, Ah, oh, Zrasbizhne. Just started talking to him in Russian. And he's like, Oh. And then, then I lost it from there because he didn't understand a word I was saying and I didn't know what I was saying either. So I just started speaking Russian. We had used the interpreter. And he came up and gave me the biggest hug. And for the next week, we sat beside each other every day. Big older guy. No hair, praise the Lord. Right there. Getting, yeah, some of you guys with thin hair, you're like, that's right, amen. But you know what? We couldn't speak each other's language, but we spoke a heart language. In one of the most unlikely places to find family, I found one in Yerevan, Armenia. You know, we got family all over the world. But I want us to look at something here. Christ also decided not to stay in heaven. He came here. He also decided not to keep what he had. He gave his life for us. He gave us salvation. You know, we wouldn't be sitting here today if Christ stayed where he was. We wouldn't be here today if he kept what he had. He also decided not to withhold what he knew. And he gave it to us. So we don't withhold it from other people either. We give it to them. We give it to them. Christ decided not to stay. Listen to me. Christ being in heaven, full of glory. I can only imagine the day that we get to go. Can you see it? Even try to get, catch a glimpse of it? Let me tell you what. Our eyes, our mind can't wrap around what heaven's going to be like. Hell is a terrible place. But you know why it's also a terrible place? It's not because of the gnashing of teeth and the burning and the fire. Christ isn't there. You know what's great about heaven? Christ is there now. But he had to leave that great place to come down here for you. He took off his crown and put on a crown of thorns. He took all the glory that the angels were singing to him, all the praise to come down here and be spit and mocked and cursed at. He sat up there on his throne and gave that up to come down here to sit upon the cross. 
came down here and they plucked his beard. They beat him to a pulp. But he couldn't stay there because he had something that we needed. And he knew we had to have it. So he came down here and died for you. He died for you. He died for you. Because he knew that's what you needed. He loves you. God can use anybody at any time. These are four unlikely heroes. Tell you about some of God's work. Sam Wilson. Most of you know Sam Wilson, right? He's one of our missionaries to the Russian speaking people. He's been in the, served in Moscow for a long period of time. He's been in Ukraine lately, serving also in Israel. And uh, there's a, um, he's telling a, a pastor friend, Brother Kohler, up in, in Loudonville, Ohio, about um, he was handing out Bibles in Red Square. And um, number one, you just don't do that. You're not supposed to do that. I guess you can do it because he was doing it. But you're not supposed to do that by law. But we don't look at their law so much. We follow God. So he's handing out these Bibles. And there's a Russian Orthodox priest there. And all the people were around this Russian Orthodox priest until Sam got the Bibles out and started handing them out to people. And everybody started flocking around Sam. And this Orthodox priest got very upset very quickly and started putting down Sam and started saying bad things about him. Sam goes, well, that's it. I'll just go over and talk to him. You know Sam. Sam's kind of, he, he's very sweet, kind of quiet. But I, I bet he's kind of guy, if you got him agitated enough, he'll let you know. So he goes there and goes, what's your problem? And they're talking to him and finding out all this and that. Well, Sam finds out that he's upset because all the people are leaving him, leaving the Russian Orthodox priest to go and talk to Sam. And Sam goes, well, here. And hands him the whole crate of Bibles. Why don't you hand these things out and the people will come back to you. Okay. Sam became his best friend. God had a Russian Orthodox priest handing out Bibles. Who's against Bibles? Lebanon. Brother Weiss out of Wichita Falls, Texas has a missionary in Lebanon. He's been taken hostage several times, been beaten and tortured by Hamas, but he still does it. Nothing too tragic, they're just trying to scare him. So he's handing out Bibles in a village, right? Five to six black SUVs pull up. He goes, uh-oh. Leader of Hamas gets out of his vehicle. Leader of Hamas for that region. I guess they have unions or something, I don't know. He said it's for that, un for that area. I didn't realize they had unions. And he gets out and he says, what are you doing? This guy goes handing out these books. What are those books of? Well, they're talking about Jesus. Jesus Christ. The guy Hamas looks at him. Then he looks at his little Hamas assistant. He goes, see those boxes right there? He goes, yes, sir. And the missionary's going, oh, no. They're going to take these. How am I supposed to get more and get these out? And he goes, I want every person in this village to have one of those books now and handed them out. That guy's standing there going, what are you doing? And then you got to start laughing because you're like, you know what? I'm not in control. God's in control of this. Why do we worry about some of the silliest stuff? God's in control. Here's a city that was... They're eating their young. They're eating dove's dung and asses' heads. And God says, you know what? It's because your king didn't believe me, didn't believe the prophet I told him. So now I've got to work through this prophet to show everybody what's going on. Let's look here. Notice here in the last verses, well, what we just read in verse 16. 
And the people went out and spoiled the tents of the Syrians. So a measure of what? Fine flour was sold for a shekel and two measures of barley for a shekel according to the word of the Lord. Let's go back to chapter 7, verse 1. And Elisha said, Hear ye the word of the Lord. Thus said the Lord, Tomorrow about this time shall a measure of fine flour be sold for a shekel and two measures of barley for a shekel in the gate of Samaria. And then the next verse is where the doubters spoke up. Let me tell you. Who's in control? That wasn't very convincing. Who's in control? God. God's in control. God's in control. So why do we worry about some of the pity little things we worry about? Am I worried about our government? Not in the slightest anymore. I used to get down. I used to get depressed. Hated watching the news. I still hate watching the news. There's nothing good on it anyway. Unless it's Ohio State winning and sun coming out and 68 degrees. I'm happy with that. But there's nothing good on the news. Because I know who's in control. And it's God. How many of you prayed specifically... I can't even hardly talk. Where's my water? Specifically for something, and God answered it. Come on, raise your hand. Raise it to glory. I don't care. Come on. Do you thank God after that, or do you just like, well, I knew God would do it because I'm, I deserve it? Or do you say, God, thank you. I knew you could do it because you could do it. It's all you. You want to see somebody who had a lot of blessings? Brother Jarvis and his wife. Man, you read their prayer letters? I don't know. I, you have to have like a big trunk to put all God's luggage in there with you guys because I mean, it, you hear the blessings that come out of what the stuff that they do and some of the stuff they've seen. Their car breaks down and there's a transmission on the side of the road. <laughs> Am I right? Was that what happened? Was it a transmission? What was that? Something was on the side of the road waiting on them and their car broke down. It was like... I go down the road and my car breaks down there's a triple A sticker. <laughs> you know? God still provided. Thank God it wasn't my transmission. So let me ask you. Why we sit here until we die? There's a great work to be done. There are people hungering. They're dying. And they need you. They need you to tell them what you know and what we have kept back for so far for so long. God is good. God is good. Let's stand. Bow your heads. Close your eyes. Brother Reed, come on up here, brother. <clears throat> brother Jarvis, I'm sorry I put you on the spot, but people had to know. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, you're amazing. You're an amazing God who loves us, who cares for us, no matter what the world thinks or what they say. Lord, I know that you are a loving God. You are just. We will have to take accountability for our lives and what we do. Lord, I hope there's one here. I hope everybody here today has accepted you as Lord and Savior. I hope they know you on a personal level and has accepted you as their King to take over their life. Lord, if there's one here today, Lord, I just ask that you work in their hearts. Let them see that who you are. Lord, what a, a wonderful passage just in Scripture that you showed this city who you are. You showed that king, through Elisha, who you were. Lord, you want to work through us as your children, just like you did through Elisha, your prophet. Lord, I want to show people 
where they can find peace and rest. They don't hunger. They don't thirst anymore, Lord, in their sin. They come and be revived. They come to the refreshing waters of your salvation. Oh, Lord, how, how much of a blessing you've blessed us with. We just don't see, Lord. Open up our eyes, our ears, that we can see who you are today. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Maybe you're here today and you said, Brother, Brother Morton, I, I really, I heard the message. I still don't understand it all. But I'm starting to think that God is real. I'm seeing that there's certain things in the world today that God is real. Maybe you haven't accepted Jesus Christ your Savior yet. You said, I want to know more. Will you just please raise your hand? I won't call you out by name. I just want to pray for you. I promise. I'll just pray for you. He loves you. He came down here. He gave it all for you. Is there one? Just by a raise of hand. Then most of this was to us believers. So today, Brother Moore and I, you know, maybe I haven't been doing what I'm supposed to. I've been kind of in my comfort zone. I've been sitting right there in the gate for so long. I'm tired of it. I'm hungry. I've had enough. I'm willing. I'm willing just to see what the Lord has for me. I'm willing to surrender everything. Is there one just by raising your hand? I just want to pray for you. Anybody? I see that. Amen. And then our Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you. I thank you for today. I thank you for a chance to be able to serve you. Lord, as we go out these doors today, I ask that you'll just keep on working on our hearts. Have we decided not to keep what we have? And we have, have we decided not to keep what we know? Lord, outside these doors, there's a whole world that needs you. Lord, help us not to forget that. Not to get in our comfy cars and go home to our comfy house and eat the food. But Lord, that as we start thinking about it, it burns our heart for those that never heard who you are, have never seen the words of God in their own language. Lord, how we have just, I feel like we have disgraced thee because we haven't done the job that we're supposed to be doing. Lord, help us. I love you and I thank you. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. As the pianist begins to play... Maybe there's someone this morning that hasn't uh, said, okay, God, try me. And uh, I'll do anything and go anywhere and be anything you want me to be, God. I'm willing to come out of my comfort zone. Altars open. Are there cares that you need to just give up to God? The worries that you need to give over to God? He can carry it. It's no struggle for Him.
Let's sing the verse, first verse of that uh, imitation hymn together. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Thou art the potter, thou art the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me, mold me and make me after thy way. up this way. Sure appreciate that, brother. I'm going to have you and uh, your lovely wife go to the back and receive everybody as we're dismissed. Let's, uh, let's sing our song of dismissal. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. Amen. On that chorus together, I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood, joined heads with Jesus as we travel this sod. For I'm a part of the family, the family of God. Amen. You are dismissed. We'll see you tonight. Look forward to another great service with Brother Moreland tonight.